So uh, custom e-bikes. I've seen a lot of uh, bike business plans, and I can tell you for certain, no one here would ever approve this idea for a business plan. <laughs> Nobody makes any money. This fabricator might make 2,000 bucks on this frame. He might have the capacity to do 10 to 15 frames a year. So he's not particularly doing this for the money. But there's passion involved, and there's art. And the thing is, is that when you combine those two, logic goes out the window, and uh, there's a window. There's, a, there's, a, there's an opening for success. And so one of the things we did early on was decide, how do we complement the custom bicycle build that's out there today? There's a flourishing market of, say, 400 handcrafted fabricators out in North America today, another couple of hundred in Europe. How do you enhance what they're doing today without hindering the process, without hindering their art? And Saris is the small OE distributor for Bosch in North America, and, and this was the problem from the beginning, one of the problems to solve. How do you enhance this process? And really, when you look at it, it looks simple. Those tubes are mitered. The tubes are bent. The chain stays are bent. It's ready to roll. You've got this motor node right in the center there. I'll, I'll start passing some of these around. How hard could it be? Well, it turns out it's always about um, eliminating barriers. And the first barrier for Bosch uh, to eliminate was the service side of things. And so, you know, we have 2,500 um, technicians in North America ready to service these bikes. So if you build the bike in Tallahassee and you ship it to Fairbanks, there's somebody there who can service it. That's the first one that's eliminated. The second one is, is these, uh, or are these motor nodes. And that's a little bit tricky. And a, a, a typical OE has a, has a large staff of product managers and engineers, and Bosch would hand the stack of drawings, and that OE is responsible to make that part. But the fabricator, he's the painter. She's the marketer. She's the, the um, whatever, the, the accountant as well. They do everything. And so to drop that stack of plans onto a fabricator if they do all of those other tasks is too much and it becomes a hindrance. So that part became the, the uh, conundrum. And what we started working on early, about five years ago, was how to create this thing so that it's not so expensive and that it can be a basis for somebody to kickstart their, their um, handcrafted frame. So we started, said, all right, let's make these things out of titanium and stainless. That's usually the, the basis for most of these fabricators. And if you, if you see and see this part, this Gen 2 node out of titanium, it's somewhere around two to $2,500. This is not gonna work. Um, but if you 3D print it, that part is somewhere around 500 which is still an expensive part, but it's, it's in the realm of possibilities when the, when the end bike is somewhere going to be $8,000 to $15,000. So we started working on creating a part that was available for these fabricators. And in the end, it started to be successful. Um, I should mention at the same time, we created this brand as basically a, uh, an example for fabricators to come in. It's an open source treasure trove of images and plans and how, do you, how did you do this? And basically, if anybody has questions, you said, well, this is how we did it and show them the images. And, and basically, it, if you want to look at a really bad business plan, this one doesn't sell anything. So that, that doesn't work out for, for anybody there except for the fabricators who are looking for an example. So from here on out, there's um, just some pretty images. So this is a, 
This is a, uh, a Gen 4 frame that Leonard Zen has on the stand right now. It's going to be completed probably today. It's for a 7 foot 6 NBA player. Um, he, as, you, as you guys probably know, Leonard runs a lot of uh, very tall frames for tall people. Um, he started on the e-bike side of things with his heart condition. And uh, he came out to see us. We, we built him his first prototype. And he was, you know, just elated that he could actually ride, have a conversation, and not have his heart condition come up. So um, happy to see that Leonard is continuing on that side of things. Uh, this, is the, this is the first bike that Firefly made in Massachusetts. And they just knocked it out of the park. It was exquisite. They have a cool uh, process in which you can drop the tube into a, an anodizing tank, change the current and the voltage, and be able to change the color on the tube where the uh, graphics are. It's really cool. That's a Gen 2 uh, speed motor they did. This is an analog trike from Juggernaut Cargo. I'm sorry, I'm out of the way there. You guys can't see so well. Um, they are in an electrification process right now. Uh, it's a pretty cool opportunity with the town of Aspen, Colorado. And they've got uh, five bikes in process in Boulder right now. It's a dual battery Gen 2 CX. And it is a sustainability project with, with Aspen to uh, move people from the Ritz-Carlton to the gondola. Um, it'll be a pretty cool high-profile pro project. And you know, these fabricators, they are passionate. They're working on these old, 60-year-old Swiss timepieces, right? The, their mills and lathes are, are what they can get, but they love what they do. That's Pete Olivetti in, in Boulder making those juggernaut parts. And so for me, um, it's a privilege because I get to deliver the recipe of how these fabricators can do this, and then I get to see the progress of how it goes. I get to work with them, and I get to see the commentary of what works and what doesn't work. And this is uh, Horse Cycles in, in Brooklyn, and he sent me this photo, and I just, I just shook my head and said, man, you cannot do that with titanium. It's so nice to see a squashed steel stay like that, because you could never do that with this. It would crack the titanium. And, and just having this back and forth of, uh, of progress of what they're doing is, is pretty cool. And you start to see, the, uh, you start to see that, that frame evolve, and you start to get this emotional tie to the frame. And this, this is the essential part with a custom frame, whether it's an e-bike, or an analog bike, and you start to get this emotional tug. And these hand fabricators, they, they have a relationship with you, and they build for you, and you start to think, man, that just raw, that could be on my wall as art. Or that could be built, and I could ride it for 10 to 20 years. And that's the real magic. You know, and you see, even even you see people still doing some brazing. We had one guy that built his own nubs on the node and brazed just because he wanted to braze. And you start to see this, you think, oh, yeah, that's, that is magical. And it brings you to the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the classic frame builders. And this is a, this is a tandem in process using a similar node to the one that was handed out. It's actually similar to this one right here. And uh, that, one will, that one will take a little bit of, of time, but that's, uh, that's going to be a cool one. And you know, some people's reaction will look at this and they'll say, that's ah, just another frame. What's the difference? And that's, that can be nice too because it can be under the radar. People may not notice the subtleties of design and the subtleties of their art. And other times you might see something a little bit different, the contrast of the lighting on the frame and the parts that are built and that emotion that you get towards the bicycle as the consumer starts to pull you in even more. And so what I would say, especially to a lot of the 
uh, OE executives around here today is that you should all go out and support your local custom e-bike manufacturer and blow 10 grand on a bike. It will feel really good to do that. <laughs> and then I would contend that if you do that, it's money really well spent. Because at the end of the day, at the end of a week of commuting, you know, some of you may have noticed there's quite a patina on this part. At the end of a week of commuting, you will notice, even if you don't say anything about the bike, you will notice, and if you dusted the thing for prints at the end of the week, maybe, you would notice that all of your product managers, all of your engineers, all the marketing staff, everybody in the company will have their grubby little prints all over that bike because as they walk by, they're like, hey, that's different. It's not our same thing that we do every single day. You know, we can, if we're, if we're going down the road and doing the same thing in all of our companies, we get a, a moldy brain, right? And this kind of a thing just like, it just dusts off the mold and lets you deviate and lets your product development crew get a little bit more creative, deviate from what they've been doing, and I bet everybody would want to be riding that bike. So thanks very much for having me.